Hello and welcome to your week seven day two lecture. Please take notes today because you will be quizzed on this information directly following this video. Today we're gonna wrap up MLA eighth edition format. So last class we talked about MLA works cited in annotated bibliography pages. In this class, we're gonna talk about the MLA in text citations. So just as a reminder, be sure to cite everything that is not common knowledge. That includes paraphrased information, it includes summarized information, it includes information that you've heard from your peers. Whatever it is that is not your own opinion or common knowledge, you need to cite with an in-text citation. In-text citations look like this, and so there are two examples right here. Livingston 5, in this case, the 5 refers to page 5, and in Livingston Pair 5, the PAR abbreviation refers to paragraph. Please include all the information that you have. So again, if you find information on page five of a document, great, but don't go to unnecessary lengths like counting 100 paragraphs in just to find the paragraph number. So just use your judgment there. If you don't have the page or the paragraph number, just simply write the last name of the person in your in-text citation. This MLA in text citation will directly tie to your works cited page. So if I again see Livingston 5, I should be able to go to your works cited page, find L because it's in alphabetical order, and then see the source from there. There are two ways to cite. Both of them are right here and both of them are color coded for your convenience. The first way is to include the person's name or the author's name in your signal phrase. So right here, Quan points out that blah, blah, blah. Quan is pointed out in your actual writing itself, and so therefore you do not need the last name in your in-text citation. If you didn't have the page number, it would be totally fine for you just to have Quan right here and to end the sentence like that. The second way to cite is to include the last name of the person in your in-text citation at the end of the sentence. Please do not combine these two attempts. Just keep one over the other because if you combine them, it becomes redundant. If you do not have the last name of the author, you abbreviate the in-text citation to the first one to three words, and you put them in the grammar that you would see in your works cited page. So in this case, automatically, I should be able to go to the works cited page, find A, and see the rest of the citation from there. And again, that's only if you do not have the author's last name. Just as a review, et al. essentially means that there are three or more authors that are listed. So you, you, in an in-text citation, you include the last name of the first person listed, the words et al., don't forget the period punctuation here, and then the page number if applicable. If you have a source that quotes another source, I have this question every quarter, so I do feel like I need to talk about it. If you have a source that quotes another source, then you use the abbreviation quoted in, QTD period in, and then the source it is that you're looking at. In your writing itself, then that's your moment to explain who's quoting what and to give further information for readers. So Ravage argues that high schools are pressured to act as, quote, social service centers. In that situation, Ravage is being quoted in Wiseman. Of course, if you can, try to find the original source rather than taking this op option. The only reason you would take this option is if you could not find the original source. I've had a lot of questions about, okay, well, what do I do if a whole paragraph cites the same exact source? To avoid redundancy and avoid you having to over and over again include the last name in the parentheses, then you can kind of vary it up a little bit. So I've color coded this to help you kind of skim. Um, use kind of different methods to include your sources. So you can say in your signal phrase, some have said, there's your in-text citation, Henry Jenkins argues, as he argues, some other critics. So use your words themselves to show that the information is not coming from your own opinion. The first time that you mention an outside source, please include the in-text citation. So for some weird reason, high schools are teaching to wait until the end of a paragraph to include your in-text citation. That's super confusing for readers and it's not ethical um, because you don't know what information is coming from your own opinion and what is coming from the outside source. So to solve that issue, the first time that you mention an outside source, include your in-text citation and go from there. I will never penalize you for including too many in-text citations. This is a funny meme. Go ahead and pause your video. You can look at it on your own time. But essentially, 
I want to comment on the fact that a lot of students lately, when they're referring to a source, they have been referring to the first name of the person who's talking. Please don't do that. You're not on a first name basis with these people, um, most likely, unless you're friends with Neil Gaiman, of course. Um, but in all seriousness, please refer, when you're talking about an outside source, please refer to the person by their last name. And that does include your interview when you're talking about your interview in your recommendation report. MLA punctuation. So say you quote something and then you have your in-text citation at the end of it. The rule is that the period goes at the outside of the in-text citation, so after the last parentheses. Your quotation will go after the last word in the sentence. So again, the formula for this is quotation, in-text citation, end of sentence punctuation. In this case, it would be a period. Some additional kind of punctuation to review. If you don't know these three things, go ahead and write them down. So ellipses um, are an example of an ellipses would be the dot, dot, dot. If I see that inside of a quotation, it means that you took something out. If I see something in the middle of the quotation with brackets around it, it means that you changed it. So a situation where you would change something in the middle of a sentence is if you changed the tense of something or you clarified a pronoun. So say your interview subject was saying I over and over again, you might want to add a bracket in and replace I with, you know, Morgan White or whatever. And of course, signal phrases, so please write this down. Quotations cannot stand alone in a paper. You always need to introduce them with a signal phrase. Signal phrases are phrases that introduce quotes. So for example, according to Morgan, comma, and then the quotation, the according to Morgan is a signal phrase. So please get used to using them in your papers. Okay, I get this question every quarter as well. MLA format and your final report. Your final report should have the document design principles that we talked about at the beginning of the quarter. It should be single spaced in a sans serif font. Um, it should be justified on both sides. It should not be in the ugly MLA format that is your annotated bibliography. So it should not be Times New Roman, it shouldn't be 12 point font all around. It shouldn't be monotonous. The only component of your final report is that is going to be MLA is going to be your in-text citations and your works cited page. Your in-text citations and your works cited page. So essentially the content of your paper will be MLA, but the format, how it looks, will not be. Please let me know if you have questions about that. Uh, I don't want you to lose points on your final report because it's in that really ugly format. So I'm now done with MLA and type citations. I'm gonna quickly talk about the Oxford comma. The Oxford comma is the comma before the and or the conjunction in a list. So this is one of the oldest um, memes out there that has to do with the Oxford comma and it's a really funny one. I'm sorry if it offends anyone. Um, but let's go ahead and look at why you would want to use the Oxford comma. So with the Oxford comma, we invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin. In this situation, each one of these commas functions to separate elements in a series. So we know that the strippers are right here and then JFK are separate entities. If you take the Oxford comma out, all of a sudden the strippers could turn into JFK and Stalin. So if that doesn't make sense, it, it might take you a minute to really process, pause the video, look at this meme, and realize this is the reason why we do want to use the Oxford comma in tech writing. The reason that we also want to use um, the Oxford comma in tech writing, aside from it just being funny, is that there was a lawsuit a number of years ago that was concerning over time. So in 2017, a judge reasoned that the law's punctuation made it unclear. Um, so if you look right here, the canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment, or distribution of. So you see the conjunction here. And because there's no Oxford comma before the or, it's hard to decipher if over time is counting shipment or distribution or if it's counting shipment and distribution. Um, so that's, that's kind of a real life example of why the Oxford comma is needed. The Oxford comma can also help with clarity. So here's an example of that. I've been reading this morning about two solutions to climate change, mosquito vaccinations and offshore drilling. So without the Oxford comma, again, the comma before the and, what it looks like is that the two solutions to climate change are mosquito vaccinations and offshore drilling. If you use your common sense and actually read it at face value, that's probably not true. So instead, a comma would be needed here. 
Oxford commas can also help with accessibility. So if you're really writing a really technical heavy report, you're going to want to use um, a lot of kind of standard punctuation to clue your readers in to context clues. So it can help with accessibility. Overall, the main takeaway from the Oxford comma is that you should use it in technical writing. The only situation where you wouldn't use it in writing is sometimes newspapers choose not to use it. So journalism chooses not to use it and that's because they're trying to save space. But tech writing does not fall into that category and so do please use it for my class. It will be on your rubrics for your final report. That's it for today. Please take the quiz after this lecture and if you have any questions, do not hesitate to email me.